Good morning. Uh, my name is Sergeant First Class Bernard. Uh, this is Sergeant Jones. We're from the uh, Army Station down in Barrie, and uh, we cover pretty much the entire Northeast Kingdom when it comes to uh, folks that are interested in the Army. Uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about my career and what kind of led me into the Army and what I've done since then and what my plans are for the future. And, uh, and Sergeant Jones will do the same, and we'll open it up to any questions you all have about uh, what it is that we do or, or what the Army's all about and whatever you, whatever you want to know. Uh, so I am actually from Auburn, Maine. I'm not from Vermont, but pretty close. It's like Vermont with less maple syrup. That's pretty much it. It's really cold. There's a lot of snow. It's all the same. Um, so I grew up there. I was getting done high school, and I'd always kind of had like an inclination to join the military. I wasn't really sure what branch I wanted to join, but I knew I wanted to do military intelligence. Um, specifically, I wanted to do human intelligence, which is the job is essentially any way of deriving information from another person, whether it be through interrogation, uh, running them as a source, uh, debriefing, etc. Uh, so I went around to the different branches to kind of to see who could offer that to me, and it turned out the Army was the only branch that I could actually guarantee that that was the job that I'd get when I joined, instead of kind of joining and getting uh, assigned a job. So I joined the Army. I went to basic training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which was my first time being further than like Nashua, I think was the furthest I had been away from that, uh, from Maine before that. So it's a little bit of a culture shock. There's like red moon dust down there. Like instead of sand, everything's red moon dust. It stains all your stuff. It's really weird. And uh, there's a lot of animals that want to kill you, which is different than Maine. Uh, so if you go to Oklahoma, word to the wise, don't play with the snakes. They're actually really poisonous and you might die. Uh, there's also like tornado alarms going off. So it was really like, it was a little bit of a, a shock for me coming from Maine because the worst thing we had was a little bit too much snow. Uh, but it was a great time. Basic training is where we get all of our basic combat training. Um, where we learn how to march, we learn how to shoot, we learn how to do you know, maneuvers and combat stuff, uh, just to get us as a, as a baseline level of soldiering in the Army. So it's nine weeks and three days long, and it's just a lot of uh, rigorous training, a lot of physical conditioning uh, to make sure that we're in shape to do whatever we need to do in the Army. After that, I went to my job training, which was in Arizona, um, and I was there for about seven months, and we were doing a lot of psychological training um, and, and training specifically on how to do my job. There's a lot of legal training because obviously with my job, there's a lot of legal requirements, what you can and cannot do, depending on the situation that you're in. Uh, after that, I got assigned my first duty assignment, which was in South Korea. And I was stationed in Seoul for two years. Um, there, what I did was I trained with the South Korean Special Warfare Command, uh, which is their version of Special Forces, on what to do if North Korea ever were to you know, start a war. So we just did a lot of training. There was no combat going on. There hasn't been combat going on in Korea in many, many years. Uh, so we just did a lot of training, and I, I got to get out and really see a lot of South Korea, which was really fascinating for me to see another culture and kind of see how, how other folks in the world live. So in the two years that I was there, um, obviously I traveled all around South Korea. I went to China. I went to Japan on, on different uh, military trips. And I got to see a lot of, a lot of different cultures and, and kind of put things in perspective for, um, for kind of how I, what my outlook on life was. Uh, after my two years there, I moved to Washington uh, State. And I was at Fort Lewis, which is um, it's like a little bit south of Seattle. I was there for about two and a half years, and while I was there, I deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, I did my job. I was attached to an infantry unit. We would go out into the populace, and I would, um, I would work with individuals in the populace, and I would provide them motivation to give me information, and we'd use that information to target uh, different bad actors in the area to remove them from the battlefield and to make the area safer. Um, if, you're, if you know a little bit about the history of Afghanistan, essentially the government collapsed many decades ago and the Taliban, which is a terrorist organization, took over the government and they essentially they were the government in the country for a very long time. And when they were in control of the country, uh, one of the biggest things that they did to kind of make the population not rise up against them was they shut down all the schools. So they shut down all the schools, they destroyed the schools, they killed the teachers, um, and they made sure that the kids could not get an education. Because it's really easy to suppress a population of folks that don't know anything different than what they're doing right now. So after a little while, you know, after they shut down the schools, the, the kids are growing up and they have no concept of what math or science or history uh, is. So they're just, they just know that the Taliban are in control they're not nice folks, but they don't know anything different because they never learned anything else. So one of the biggest missions that we did while we were there is we're, we were trying to reopen schools and get teachers back in and get kids into school so they can learn something more than just oppression, which is what they lived in. But again, if you only live in oppression, you know nothing else, it's really hard to get out of that cycle. Uh, so a lot of what we did there was to, to do that, to open up the schools, 
um, improve the roadways by taking out the explosive devices that the Taliban had planted and trying to remove a lot of the leadership of the Taliban in the area to kind of make them shift out of the area and make it safer for the civilians that were there. Uh, and we were there for a little under a year and, and the difference between when we got there and when we left was, was night and day. Uh, so I, I'm really proud of what I did over there and I, I felt like it was, very, um, it was very fulfilling for me to get to do my job and to get to see uh, what I was doing was actually impacting the area for the, the better. And at that point, that's kind of when I decided that I would stay in the Army for the rest of, you know, I'll do 20 years in the Army. Because uh, it, it was really fascinating and it was really um, fulfilling. So I'll keep doing this forever. Uh, after that, I came back to Washington. I was there for a couple months and I got orders to go to Fort Carson, which is in Colorado, uh, about an hour south of Denver. I was there for about two and a half years. And when I was there, we were just doing a lot of training to prepare to go to Iraq. Um, and right before we deployed, um, the Army gave me orders to come out to Vermont and do uh, uh, recruiting uh, for a couple of years. So essentially how it works for, for us is once you're a mid-careerist, they kind of they pull you outside of your job to go uh, either into recruiting, drill sergeant, or be an instructor. And since I waited, I got selected for recruiting. I should have volunteered for something else. Um, so we come out here for a couple of years. It's, it's a good thing because it gets a good cross-section of the Army. If you look in our office, we have a tanker in our office. We have myself doing military intelligence. We have a guy that does um, computer networking. We have an administrative assistant -like type working guy. And then Sergeant Jones actually repairs uh, electronics and radios, does a lot of electrical work. So it's good to get a good cross-section of the Army so that if folks come in and they're interested in different aspects, one of us can at least probably touch on exactly what they're looking for or we've had the experience before. Uh, so a couple of the cool things since I've been in the Army, uh, I got my bachelor's degree, which was 100% paid for, um, and I, I think I took 12 classes because all of my training since I've been in the Army, all transfers to military or to, to college credits. So I transferred all of my training from the Army uh, to my college, and when it was all said and done, I took 12 classes to get my bachelor's degree. So my bachelor's four-year degree took me about two years to get, and I didn't pay a penny for it. Um, right now I'm working on my master's program. Uh, and I'm actually leaving. This is uh, recruiting is a three-year gig, and I'm actually done in, in a week. And uh, I'm moving out to Monterey, California, where I'm going to go back to my job. And I'm learning Russian. Actually, I'm going to Russian school, and I'll be there for a little over a year, just learning how to speak Russian. And I actually get another degree out of that, which I'm pretty excited about. Yes. Why do you need to learn how to speak Russian? Uh, so for my job, my whole purpose is to talk to other people in different cultures and get information from them. Um, so there's certain, you know, in my job, if there's 400 of us, then 20 of us need to be Russian linguists, 20 of us need to be Arabic linguists, 20 of us need to be Farsi linguists, etc. Uh, so I volunteered to be a Russian linguist because it's, I've always been interested in Russian. Um, so it was an opportunity that came down and I'm, you know, I'm set to go back to my job and it was just kind of a, a cool move to make. Plus Monterey is like 70 degrees year round and it doesn't snow there. So that was a, that was a big, big part of my choice. I'm not going to lie. I live in West Danville, so I got like 10 foot snow drifts and stuff. So I was like, let's go. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of my, my take on the Army. I plan to do 20 years. My whole goal in life is to, uh, to retire at you know, late 50s, early 60s, and have a cabin on a lake in Maine and fish. Like that's, that's all I want in life. Um, and the Army has kind of paved my way to get there and, uh, and to be very comfortable while I'm there. Uh, so I'm, I'm using all of the experience, all the training I'm getting in the Army, and my goal after my 20 years in the Army, I'll be 38 years old. Uh, my plan is to move to probably the D.C. area and work for an intelligence agency there for a couple of years, and then I'll retire again and I'll, I'll move back up to Maine. But one of the big uh, motivators for me to, to do the Army and to join was I, it was something that I was really passionate about. And I would encourage everybody, you know, not just military, but in life, Pick something that you're really passionate about when you're looking for a job, because if you're not passionate, it's just going to be, it's, it's not going to be fun. And when I was growing up, my dad, he was a salesman for Pepsi, and he was not passionate about that. So every morning he woke up and he said a lot of words that I'm not going to repeat ever. And, and then he'd go to work, and then he'd come home really late at night, and he'd say a lot more words that I shouldn't repeat ever. And I was like, all right, this guy's just not having a good time. And I, I respect my dad. He, he raised us very well. And he, he uh, made money to make the kids comfortable in uh, growing up, but he really didn't enjoy what he was doing. So I said, well, I wanna be able to support my family, but I don't wanna be miserable like he was doing it. So what can I do that I'm passionate about and that will pay the bills 
Um, and, and this is what I chose to do, and I'd say it's, it's, very, uh, it's very lucrative <laughs> if you stay in a little bit. Uh, and it's definitely paving the way to, uh, to make sure that I'm comfortable in the future. And the, the big college benefit, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard that you get free college in the Army. I'm not actually using that because I'm doing all my schooling while I'm in. So I'm going to pass my college benefit to my kids. So I'll be able to put them through college as well, um, just based off my service. So I'm pretty excited about it. That's kind of my 10-minute uh, my story of what I do and why I'm in. Uh, and then Sergeant Jones, if you want to go into yours real quick. Right. So I'm Sergeant Jones. I'm originally from Georgia. Uh, it's hot. There's no snow ever. So I, uh, whenever I finished high school, I originally went straight to work and, and going to college full time. I started a family quite early, and uh, I got I had a wife and three kids, and it was quite tough to pay for college and work full time and try to provide for them off of that. It's because whenever you're first coming out, you're not going to get a job that's going to pay forty dollars an hour or something really beneficial. It's, always generally very low and um, I always had an interest in joining the army but I didn't want to leave the wife and kids and so it kept me from joining from straight out of high school but uh, after doing that for a while I realized I was not happy with how it was quite a struggle and trying to take care of them and them and all that stuff so I wanted to go ahead and join and start working towards having a much more successful future. And so I joined and my wife wasn't completely happy at first, but she understands. But uh, I got sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. And then from there I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia for my job training, which is electronic radio repair. Not too much really exciting stuff about it. We fix electronics. I've been, there's some other stuff that I get to do, like sometimes we're attached, we get attached to uh, mechanics and stuff like that. We get attached with them, so we go, we're able to fix vehicles and stuff like that as, as well. So it's not just electronics that I've been able to work on since I've been in. But from Fort Gordon, my first assignment was Alaska. And that was quite a shock for me going up there because it was cold and a lot of snow and it was dark in the winter time. And I had never experienced that in my life until then. And then I uh, had a lot of fun up there. It's a great time. I spent three years there. From there I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And while I was at Kentucky, I was able to go, I was sent to the border for the border security <coughs> support. And what we had to do was provide bring food, water, uh, help set up like shower systems and stuff like that, tents and stuff for the border se security and also for the uh, people trying to seek asylum and all that stuff as well. Uh, from there, shortly after I came back from that, I got tasked to come to recruiting. And so I went to school for that and I'd always wanted to go to Vermont. It's like one of my bucket list items. And so, luckily, I managed to get here. So here I am. I've only been here just a few weeks. But ever since I've been in, I've, every place I've always had a, I've always wanted to go to Alaska. I've always wanted to see Vermont. Colorado is next on my list. So I've always been able to go to the places that I've wanted to go. So it's worked out very well for me. Um, financially, it's been quite a bit better. I've just recently bought my first house. So I've only been in five years and I plan on going to college here soon and I plan on passing the <coughs> college benefits on whenever I retire. That's about all I have so far. All right. Does anyone have any questions about either of our, our stories or about the Army in general or the military life or why is the sky blue, the grass green? Someone's got to rip the Band-Aid. If the first person asks it, then it'll open it up for everybody else. Yes, sir. I'll bite. Uh, right. It's pretty cool you're going to the language school in Monterey. My grandmother's brother went there in the 1930s. Oh, nice. Uh, worked out really well for him. Yeah. Does that mean you're likely headed to Russia after no, you learn Russian? No, I would be dead instantly if I went to Russia. Uh, <laughs> I, I am not probably ever going to go there. Um, we'll probably, I'll do a lot of stuff in Eastern Europe, but yep. 
Um, being with my job and, and stuff, we're probably on a list. Like it's probably not a good idea. Um, I'll I'll do stuff around, but I don't think I'll ever go. Yep. I'd love to. I'd, I've always wanted to, but I kind of. It's probably not in the cards for me at this point. Yeah. How did you How did you choose that language as opposed to one of one of the other ones? Why? I've Russian? always been really uh, interested in Russian. I've I've um, just done a lot of studying in the past about the Russian problem set and kind of what's going on there. And it's always been really interesting to me because I've always been interested in like spying and whatnot. And if you, you know, if you go back to uh, during the Cold War, all the spying that was going on, I thought that was fascinating. I, I always watched shows and read books and all of that about that. So um, they wanted me, when I asked for language training, they were really pushing for um, Indonesian and Mandarin. And I just like, I've already been to Asia and like, I kind of feel like I checked that block. And so I, I kind of wanted to do something on the other, you know, on the other side. So. Uh, Russian for me was was definitely like an easy choice <laughs> out of the options that they had. It, it all goes off of um, like strength. So if we need 20 in this language and we only have five, then they're going to try and fill that one. So they had five languages. I, I want to say it was Farsi, Russian, Mandarin, Tagalog, and Indonesian. Um, they're actually really pushing Indonesian, but that really pigeonholes you into one very small area. And I didn't yep. want to be there for the rest of my career. So Russian was a was a pretty easy choice for me. What else? Yes. Wouldn't they train you for like any scenario though? For uh, I'm sorry. For what? Like if you were to go to Russia, wouldn't they have trained you for the scenarios that could happen? Like yes. To go there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just not uh, very beneficial for me to go there. Honestly, there's a lot of Slavic countries around Russia that speak Russian as well, so I'd probably do a lot of work there, um, more more likely than not. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. How, do you, how does it work to pass down your college benefits to your kids? So when you do um, three years of active duty military service, regardless of branch, uh, you earn what's called the post-911 GI Bill, which pays for 100% of tuition uh, for four years to a public institution or pays up to a certain cap to a private school. Um, so I earn that benefit as soon as I do three years in the Army. So not only does it pay tuition, but it also pays a monthly stipend uh, for living based off the area code of where you're going to school. So for like Norwich, it's like two grand a month. But if you went to school in Kentucky, it'd be like $4 a month because the cost of living there is minimal. Not li It'd be more than that, but you get the point. Um, so since I'm not using it, I have the option to pass it on to my kids. So my daughter is not even 18 months old, but I'm not using it, obviously. I'm getting my master's degree paid for by the Army, and I'm about to get another degree for free for going to Russian training. So as much as I'd love to be in college for the rest of my life, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, um, it, all it is is like signing one paper and I, I hand it down to my kids. So if I have another kid, what I'll do is probably do 50 50. And I'll, you know, one will get two years, the other one will get two years, and then they can figure out the other two years. I figured it out, right? <laughs> what other questions? Uh, I have one back here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I guess it's for the both of you guys. But um, you're spending a lot of time away from your, from your family, but like, like you said, your wife wasn't. Too happy at first. Is, uh, is it is it like simple enough? Like, do you just, does your whole family pick up and move? Or so as far as like moving like duty locations, so for example, I'm in Vermont right now. My wife and kid, like we all live in West Danville. I'm about to go to school in Monterey. Um, so they're all coming with me to Monterey. Uh, the only time that your family's not with you is when you're in like a training. Like if you go to the, the field to do shooting training or whatever for a week, then obviously your family's not gonna go with you. Uh, if you deploy to a combat zone, your family's not gonna go with you. But my wife was with me in Korea, uh, since it's not a combat zone, but like Afghanistan, obviously she was not. So I was in Afghanistan for a little under a year without her. And that's just, that's one of those things. It's, it's a sacrifice you make, uh, but at the same time, like I joined full well knowing that that was a possibility. So it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me that much. It was, um, I'm not gonna say like it was the funnest time in the world being away from my, my wife, but at the same time, I came in with the expectation that that was gonna happen at some point. That. Yeah, that's the, that's the same. I mean, like, whenever I'm going, and I don't like it, but I understand it at the same time, like, part of the job. Yeah. Some of you guys. She understands it, you know. So. Well, yes. Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of choice in where you guys go and yep. um, what you guys do. Is that true for everyone? So when you first join and you go to basic and job training, when you come out of job training, you're under what's called needs of the Army. So they're going to say, all right, for your job specifically at your rank, I need five people in Korea, I need two people at Washington, two people in you know, Colorado, whatever. So they give you a wish list and you can kind of put like, 
your top three in the States and then your top two if you had to go overseas, which would be Italy, Germany. Uh, we consider Alaska and Hawaii overseas, uh, Japan, Korea, etc. cetera. Uh, so you do top three in the States, top two overseas, and they try and line it up with what the vacancies are. But if you're listing stuff that they don't have vacancies for, then you might go somewhere that you didn't necessarily plan on going. I've always gone where I wanted to go after my first assignment by re-enlisting. So when I first came in the Army, I was under a three-year contract. So when I got to the two-year mark, you can start, if you're one year out from the end of your contract, you can renegotiate to sign another contract. Um, and every time you renegotiate, you can renegotiate to change your job if you don't like your job, you, to change your duty station, like where you're actually physically at, uh, to get a bonus, you know, whatever, or to go to like a certain school or whatever. So I've always used my reenlistments to go to different places. I always want to go to Washington. I always want to go to Colorado. So I kind of used it to go to different places. And the last one, I was here um, in Vermont already, and I already had my language training lined up. So the last time I reenlisted, I just did it for a bonus, and I got like 20 grand. Uh, to stay in for a couple more years, which I was always going to do 20, so thanks for the money. I was going to do it anyways, but you had something? Yes, so how many ranks are there? So there's, a, there's different uh, sections of the Army. So there's enlisted, which is E1 through E9. Uh, there's warrant officers, which is uh, W1 through W5. And then there's uh, officers, which is O1 through O10. 10? We'll call it 10. <laughs> Um, and so it, the enlisted side is like the, the force that actually does the work in the army. The warrant officer side are the uh, kind of the technical experts for the work that's being done. And the officers are more of the management and tr like uh, just planning everything out. They do a lot of the management, less of the hands-on work and more of just the managerial, um, making sure folks are in the right place and, and trained on the right stuff. So what does a five-star general do? Five-star general doesn't exist more often than not because that would be, that only gets declared in a wartime. The last time that got declared, I think it was World War II. Yes. Um, so four-star is really the, the highest. And the four-star general, there's several of them in the Army and they control the major commands. So we have um, different major commands in the Army that cover different regions of the world. And generally speaking, four-star generals would be in charge of one of those major commands or a three-star general, depending on which one it is. Yes. Um, would you guys know basically when you started the job? Would I know? I'm sorry. Would you guys know basically when you started? Yeah. Um, I had never done an interrogation when I was 18, you know what I mean? So I picked the job, I was really excited about it, uh, but I got the training and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is different. Uh, so it was very, yeah, I'd say I was nervous, yeah, for sure. I'm not too, too cool to admit that I wasn't, you know, I was a little bit nervous. Um, but the, the good thing about the Army is they test you, the test that you get before you join, it's an aptitude test, so they're testing you specifically on what you have the ability to learn. So if you score a certain amount on that test, it'll show you jobs available to you based off of what you have the ability to learn. So you know if you qualify for one of those jobs, then there's a pretty good chance out there that you'll be all right. You'll, you'll figure it out. And very, it, it's a, I don't know how the algorithm works. So I don't want to pretend to know because it's all crazy, but uh, it does very well because traditionally speaking, the majority of people that go to job training for whatever job they usually do very well. I don't, they don't see too many people fail out. But, yes, ma'am. Um, can you talk about the badges? Yeah, sure. So um, on the dress uniform, I'm going to do it on him because it's easier because I can look at it. Uh, on the the, uh, the uniform, anytime you see stripes or anything like this, that's the rank. So he's a Sergeant E5, so he has three stripes, three chevrons. I'm Sergeant First Class E7, so I have the three chevrons, and then I have two rockers on the bottom because I'm two ranks higher than he is. Um, up here is the unit insignia, so every different unit in the Army has a different unit insignia. Uh, and so this is the one for uh, Recruiting Command. Uh, this is his branch, so he is, uh, it's kind of weird how it's set up. Even though he's an electrician for radios, he actually falls under the Ordnance Corps, which is like where all the explosives are. Um, so this is the Ordnance Corps. And then these are his awards, so this is everything he's done in the Army as far as um, getting awards for different achievements that he's done or, or combination medals for um, service in different areas, and then kind of where he's been. Um, and then you get a good conduct medal if you're a good young man or lady. The National Defense Ribbon for doing the right thing. Global War on Terror, uh, Army Service, and uh, say overseas. Uh, yes. <laughs> we have a lot of ribbons. Overseas. And then, uh, and then he has his driver's badge. If you drive over a certain amount of miles uh, without having an accident, you have a driver's badge. And then you have your marksmanship badge which changes depending on how well or not well you shoot. Um, and then the name tape, 
this is any unit award. So the awards won by the unit that you were in or you know, while you were there. So mine is from uh, this one. My unit uh, was awarded that from our um, deployment to Afghanistan. So regardless of what unit I'm in, I wear this for the rest of my, my time in the Army. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I think mine's about the same. We're wearing two different uniforms today. So and this is his recruiter badge. And then on, on this side, I have my deployment uh, badge because this is a unit that I deployed with to Afghanistan. So I'll wear this for uh, unless I get another one that I want to put on there. Good. <laughs> Depending on the uniform, we might have different stuff on. If we're in like the, the combat uniform, then really like we don't have much on there. Um, it's just our rank, name tapes. Uh, you can wear the recruiter badge. And then I have this one that I wear on my, com on my combat uniform. This is a combat action badge. That just means that when I was deployed, I was in direct contact with the enemy, like I was in a firefight, essentially. So if you get in a firefight, you get that one. What are the questions? Yes, sir. So uh, regardless of the role that you're in and you sign up for, is everybody trained for combat in some degree? Yes. And uh, basic training is basic combat training. So in yeah. the nine weeks, three A's that you're there, you're doing a lot of... If you come in as medical, like you're going to go to basic combat training. Now, if you're a nurse in the Army, there's like a 0.01% chance that you're ever going to see combat because we trained you for years to be a nurse. It doesn't make sense for us to give you a gun and say like, hey, let's yep. get on out there. But if everything goes wrong and World War III kicks off, I don't know. <laughs> like, that was going to be my next that's question. Thing, like if something know? major happens, to yeah. what extent is it all hands on deck? No, I don't think it'll be like that. Um, we have different roles in the Army for a purpose. So, I mean, if major combat kicks off, a nurse is still going to need to be a nurse. So at the end of the day, we don't expect a lot of different roles to ever see combat, but at the same time, if they ever do, you know, we, we want that to be something that they at least are, you know, we want them, want them to pick up a gun and be like, all right, what does this do? Yeah. So we, we do some training to that aspect. I mean, there's been times in Afghanistan where little combat outposts have been overrun by the Taliban, and it was the infantry combat outposts, and so the, the infantry guys are all very well trained, but there's a mechanic there that fixes their truck, and there's a uh, cook there that's been making them food. And there's an administrative guy there that's been doing their paperwork. So all those guys, we want them to know, you know, at least how to point and shoot, if, if nothing else, and know the basic stuff. So in basic training, you get very basic introduction into combat um, tactics and, and using weapons. But traditionally speaking, the majority, I mean, in the Army, there's 150 different jobs, and 20 of those are actually directly related to combat. The rest of them are support one way or another. You had a question? Others. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so obviously you're in a school right now. You but folks are in the recruiting business. Yes. So you're seeing folks come to you that want to go in the military. Yes. Yeah. What would you say are some of the biggest hurdles that you're seeing to folks being able to be successful? Okay. In? Great question. So right now there is um, there's less than 24% of uh, the recruiting age that we look at, which is 17 to 34, less than 24% of people in that age bracket even qualify to join. And there's multiple reasons for that. One reason is people drop out of school and don't get their high school diploma. Um, it's very hard to join with a GED if you're gonna get that, and it's impossible to join without a GED or a high school diploma. Um, so that's one big reason. People don't think school is important or they, they you know, miss requirements or whatever and don't graduate. And if you don't graduate, we want an educated force. So this isn't Vietnam. We're not just gonna be like, yeah, sure, come on in, here's a gun, woo. You're not gonna join. Um, another big issue is legal issues, especially in rural areas. Everyone likes to get DUIs when they're like 16 years old. Uh, we will kindly ask you to leave us alone um, because you will not join. Um, there is some legal stuff that we understand and we'll look at the whole person concept. You did something when you were young, it was a bad mistake. You understand that, you've grown from it, you haven't done anything else. And we will, um, we will review each case individually to see if we'll allow it or not. Um, a lot of stuff around here that we're dealing with is now that uh, marijuana is legal in Vermont, we have issues with that because we don't, we don't like it. Um, so if you ever got a possession charge, like now Vermont is, I think they're dismissing a lot of that stuff, but we don't look at that as dismissed. We look at that as a, a drug possession felony. So certain legal stuff's a little bit harder uh, for us to deal with. Another big one is medical uh, issues. A lot of folks are on medication for different uh, conditions that are being diagnosed. Um, and that's just kind of a trend. I don't know if in my generation or, or in your generation, if we just didn't talk about it or if it's gotten, if it really has gotten progressively worse, but we see a lot more people 
diagnose and on medication for a, a multitude of stuff, whether it be you know personality disorders or um, just mental stuff. So, uh, and then obesity would probably be um, a, a pretty big contributor to that as well. Um, so there's there's pretty rigid height and weight requirements. So, out of those, you know that that dwindles the force down from from everyone 17 to 34 can join, and then once you factor that all in, less than 24 percent. I'd say that. And that's a statistic across the entire United States, but I would say from my experience and being in recruiting for three years, it's generally accurate. You know, so one out of every four people I talk to is, is qualified, the rest are not. Yeah. Any other questions? So yes, you joined right out of high school. I did, he waited uh, two years. Yeah, I waited. So what's the difference if someone say, just thinks they want to go to college, they get part way through college, they want to join, or they want to join after it doesn't matter. Um, you can join at any time. Yeah, so if you do a college for a little bit and you have a couple classes, you'll come in at a higher rank. Yes. So you get credit for, for stuff like that. If you took a gap year, which everybody likes to take around here, uh, no, you don't get credit for that. You get a, where the heck have you been for a year? That's about it. Um, but yeah, so there's different requirements. If you have X amount of credits, you can go in one rank higher. If you have even more, if you have your bachelor's degree already, and you want to come enlisted, then you come in three ranks higher. Um, so it's, or you can commission as an officer, you know. So there's a lot of different um, opportunities. All right, that's all um, the time that we have for today, but can we thank them for coming? Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us.